last time the Soviets prepared for their next offensive. Now they were ready to launch it. We're about to see the Soviet drive towards Memel, 3rd Panzer Army's attempts to stop them, and the formation of the Kurland Pocket as Army Group North withdraws into it. Was there anything that Hitler, Schirner, or Raus could do about this? Let's find out. Bagramian attacked from the area west of Shaole towards Memel on the 5th of October. 6th and 2nd Guards, 4th Shock, and 43rd Armies, supported by the refitted 5th Guards Tank Army with 51st Army in 2nd Echelon, crashed into the German front north of the Shaole Tilsit Road, heading towards the coast. Unfortunately, the fog prevented the Soviet Air Force from supporting the attack, and artillery support wasn't available until after the fog had lifted at 1100 hours. Even so, as early as 0830 hours, the German lines began to crack in several places. Then the artillery battered the inexperienced Volksgrenadier divisions. All five German infantry divisions were in the first defensive line, as if along a string. One only had to break through this string with a forceful thrust, and there would be no further cohesion, as there were no strong reserves to the rear. Schirner threw in what reinforcements he had. The Gross Deutschland and 7th Panzer Divisions were sent to 28th Army Corps, 5th Panzer Division to 40th Panzer Corps, and 21st Infantry Division is sent to 9th Army Corps. Despite reinforcement by Sperrgruppe Schaefer, a regiment-sized Kampfgroup from 3rd SS Panzer Corps, 201st Security Division was battered by the 4th Shock Army. 2nd Guards Army, reinforced by forcefully recruited Latvian soldiers, including the 16th Latvian Rifle Division, struck the German lines around Kelmer. Henritzi of 40th Panzer Corps sent in part of Drecker's 5th Panzer Division to save 548th Volksgrenadier Division, which was falling apart under the pressure of the assault. It reached the area that evening, in time to stave off a complete collapse. The Heinz 551st Volksgrenadier Division, consisting of Navy and Luftwaffe personnel, as well as other poorly trained or ill-suited recruits, somehow managed to hold against the first two Soviet assaults from 43rd Army. The third, though, shattered them. They were completely overrun, the survivors scattering. A battalion from the Gross Deutschland Division was sent in to stabilize the situation, but failed to do so, and found itself withdrawing with the remnants of the Heinz Division later that evening. 28th Corps was clearly in trouble. Lorenz's Gross Deutschland Division had partly arrived in the 549th Volksgrenadier Division's area. I say partly because many of its tanks had been left behind due to a lack of fuel and were quickly surrounded by Soviet troops. Yanks rallied the remnants of the 549th Division around his HQ unit and assembled whatever guns he could find. Realising that the nearby tanks would be needed if they were to hold on, they actually counterattacked in order to rescue them. Defending the tank crews, fuel was siphoned from other vehicles, allowing the panzers to carry on. Raus desperately threw in whatever he had. Service and logistical troops, some staff officers, a submarine school, anything he could find to create a front. But he was only delaying the inevitable. And something not mentioned in Rouse's memoirs is that 3rd Panzer Army had lost all control of the situation. 
In fact, the opposite is implied, that they successfully created strong point positions and then withdrew to new lines slowly over the next few days, gallantly preventing a breakthrough. That is completely untrue. By the evening of the first day, the Soviets had torn a 90 kilometer gap in the German lines. Volsky's 5th Guards tank army was now exploiting into the German rear areas. 43rd Army was 17 kilometers deep inside 28th Army Corps. Second Guards Army was 7 kilometers deep inside 40th Panzer Corps lines. Clearly, this wasn't the successful withdrawal that Rouse implies. Reinforcements were sent from the north to try and stabilize Rouse's area, including 14th Panzer Division and a bunch of anti-tank and anti-aircraft battalions. However, these were all hampered by refugees fleeing along the roads, and 14th Panzer Division wouldn't arrive until the 6th. A six-year-old girl named Vyra Viki was on one of the roads heading for Kurland. She would later become the president of Latvia. There was me, my stepfather, and my mother with a baby in her arms, my sister Marit. I was six. I turned seven in Liepaja. Marit was born in May, so she was just six months old. By January, she was dead, only ten months old, from pneumonia. And, I think, to some extent, starvation. Scherner commenced Operation Donner in the evening of the 5th, and 16th and 18th armies began moving into the Riga East positions. Anton's 6th Air Defence Division maintained air security during the withdrawal, and 3,000 railcars were loaded with equipment from Riga alone. Lieutenant General Frankowitz of 215th Infantry Division was made responsible for the flow of traffic between Riga and 8 miles east of Dzutska. Mayor of 329th Infantry Division was in charge from Dzutska onwards. And an additional bridge was constructed next to the two bridges at Riga for the motorized units. 40 Navy and Army Engineer ferries were made for the other formations, all to help the withdrawal proceed smoothly. To the north, Soviet forces also landed on the island of Sarama in the early morning fog on the 5th of October. Infantrymen from Pan's 8th Estonian Rifle Corps landed first, carving a strong bridgehead in the north. Then, the 109th Rifle Corps reinforced as well. The German leadership had not expected the Soviets to land at six different locations over a 20 kilometer wide front, and were caught completely off guard. The widely dispersed landing tied up so many German forces in the first hours that they could not organize a strong counterattack. Colonel Eulenberg's 67th Infantry Regiment of 23rd Infantry Division offered the first real resistance, along with the 2nd Battalion of the 323rd Infantry Regiment, with the 532nd Naval Artillery Regiment in support. The Eastern Territories Naval Commitment Battalion was encircled on the coast and had to break out of its pocket after heavy casualties. Then, the Soviets attacked over the Muhu Sarama Dam, and moved to the southwest. On the 6th of October, these Soviet tanks with infantry broke through the German positions and drove towards Kurosara. With the German defences compromised, Schirmer was forced to give up the north and centre of the island, and began falling back towards the Sorva Peninsula. Other German forces withdrew to a line 20 kilometers north of Kurosara. This retreat was not so organized, with German forces becoming disorganized in the woods, pursued by Soviet forces. 
It also appears that both sides shot any prisoners they took, although it's not clear why they decided to do this. As this was going on, the Soviets bombed the harbour of Montu in the Sova Peninsula, smashing up the entire area and sinking several boats. Its destruction would limit German supply capabilities to the island and hurt their subsequent defensive actions. On the mainland, 1st Tank Corps reinforced 2nd Guards Army and 19th Tank Corps reinforced 6th Guards Army. There was nothing left to oppose them! I don't know why you would need to use an exclamation mark there, Haupt, but alright. Anyway, 14th Panzer Division had arrived at the town of Alsa at noon. Now they were instructed to move to Prequely, link up with the Grossdeutschland Division, which had seen many of its strong points surrounded and overrun, and form some sort of defence line. They were, at all costs, to prevent the capture of the ports of Memel and the Apaya. So, over the next two days, they formed a defence line between Prequely and Skudas, consisting of barbed wire, mines and strongpoints. Operation Donner, the German withdrawal from Riga into Kurland, really got going on the 6th of October 1944. The Germans scorched the earth as they retreated. Grain fields ready to harvest were burned, as were forests full of valuable trees. Livestock that couldn't be taken along were killed. Railway stations, telegraph and telephone stations, buildings of no military value, even churches, were demolished. The country was plundered, pillaged and destroyed by the very people who had vowed to protect Latvia from the return of Soviet terror. On Sarama, the town of Kurosara was also evacuated and surrendered, with German forces withdrawing further south. 218th Infantry Division fell back to the entrance to the Sorva Peninsula and quickly dug in. Lang would now block the Soviets at what became known as the Salma Bridgehead. Meanwhile, to the south, 4th Panzer Division, armed with Panther tanks, was moved to block 4th Shock Army's advance in the Verkshenay area. Reaching the area, they were battered by the 119th Rifle Division's artillery, but succeeded in retaking the village. 5th Panzer Division launched a counterattack into the southern flank of the Soviet advance, while Laukert's forces struck south. These attacks failed, and 5th Panzer Division had to fall back to the southeast to 548th Panzer Grenadier Division's area. On the 7th, the decision was made that, since Luftwaffe 1 operated with the Latvian and Estonian Luftwaffe legions, who had previously fought well but had recently started deserting by flying their aircraft to Sweden, the Latvian and Estonian Luftwaffe legions would formally be dissolved this day. Luftflotte 1 also fell back and now operated from bases deep in Kurland. They perhaps had an easier move than those travelling on foot. The primitive roads were choked with dusty columns of trucks and tanks. Lines of refugees with wagons and handcarts piled high with belongings filed through the Latvian capital day and night. The bellowing of confused and weary herds of cattle filled the air as they were driven westwards over the brick-paved streets. To the south, 3rd Belarusian Front now began its advance. 95th Infantry Division collapsed and fell back, forcing 5th Panzer Division to commit to the area in order to form a southern front of some sort. 28th Army Corps attempted to build a line with the remnants 
of the 551st Volksgrenadier, 7th Panzer and Grossdeutschland divisions. Volsky's tanks simply moved south of them, rendering the line pointless. 7th Panzer Division was surrounded at one point, having to make a desperate and costly flight to reach safety. A battalion from the Grossdeutschland was also surrounded elsewhere, and managed to break out that evening. This allowed Major General Malakov's 19th Tank Corps to move ahead and reach the East Prussian border on the evening of the 7th of October, having sliced through portions of the Grossdeutschland division in the process. Here, the 3rd Panzer Army had no active troops! Again, unnecessary exclamation mark. Only the 2nd Field Light Infantry Command under General of Infantry von Oven took up the necessary protection against the advancing enemy tanks. At the same time, they had the task of stopping individual deserters and directing them back to their troop units. Schoener reacted to the situation by giving all of 18th Army's troops east of the Daugava River to the 16th Army on the 7th of October. This freed 18th Army to concentrate on preventing 1st Baltic Front advancing to the west and northwest. Along with 14th Panzer Division, a blocking line was being formed between Majiki and Skudas to prevent 4th Shock Army from breaking through. On Sarama, on the 8th, the Soviets launched tanks and infantry against the Germans defending the Salma bridgehead. They cut through the front in two places. Therefore, the Germans fell back to the northwest point of the peninsula, to the RSD blocking position, which they defended with the 67th Infantry Regiment and the 23rd Artillery Regiment. On the 9th, Volsky's 5th Guards Tank Army overran 3rd Panzer Army HQ and reached the coast on both sides of Memel on the 10th. In the process, they rolled into two concentration camps north of Kretinga. It was normal policy for the SS to evacuate such camps before the arrival of Soviet soldiers, and if such an evacuation were impossible, the inmates of the camp were often simply shot. On this occasion, the speed of the Soviet advance appears to have made any such measures impossible. The sight of so many malnourished prisoners shocked many of the battle-hardened Soviet soldiers, further feeding the implacable desire for revenge. 43rd and 2nd Guards armies also made good progress, and the Soviets reached the East Prussian defence positions. 51st Army also reached the Baltic Sea near Polangen, north of Memel, on the 10th of October 1944. Golnik's 28th Army Corps, with the 58th Infantry, Grossdeutschland, and 7th Panzer Divisions were now encircled inside the city. This meant that the 3rd Panzer Corps, and the remainder of Army Group North, were now cut off from Germany. Army Group North was cut off from the homeland for the second time. This time it was forever! Again, was that exclamation mark really necessary, Hapt? Further north, 2nd Baltic Front also attacked towards Riga on the 10th of October, and the Germans continued their flight out of Riga. Along a handful of roads, 35 army divisions, thousands of refugees, 80,000 motor vehicles, and countless numbers of horses and carts fled from Riga to the west. The whole situation was chaotic, and having been cut off from the Reich, and in the disorder of the withdrawal, German logistics were now haphazard, to say the least. The soldiers supplemented their rations with horse meat from wounded horses, which had been hit by Soviet fire, in order to stave off hunger. A situation eerily similar to that of the 6th Army at Stalingrad. Of course, the question is, would Army Group North, two entire armies meet a similar fate as that of the 6th Army. 
Despite the hard fighting and some delays, the Soviet strike towards Memel was a very successful operation overall. Unlike Operation Doppelkopf and Caesar, the Soviets had successfully hidden their attack from their enemy, had used more infantry units, and had mounted their attack in more open terrain. Instead of relying upon tanks to do all the work, Bagramian had sent his infantry forwards first to break through the German lines. Once this occurred, 5th Guards tank army was thrown in to exploit. The attack hadn't gone super smoothly. Delays were caused by the weather, the logistical issues, which was mainly due to the fact that several armies were operating in the same area. Huge numbers of fleeing civilians clogged the roads, impacting the advance, and Volsky had arguably performed poorly, at least in Bagramian's eyes. But the Soviets had reached the coast, and Army Group North was now cut off from the rest of Germany. So, would the Germans just accept their fate, or would they attempt to break out of their trap? Is it a comma? Is it a full stop? No, it's exclamation man! The OKH reported that Hitler had categorically prohibited the withdrawal from Riga. General Schoener ignored the Führer's directive. He ordered the immediate withdrawal from the Latvian capital. Seriously, this guy loves his exclamation marks. And also, this quote is interesting because it directly contradicts the fact that the withdrawal had already begun, and the fact that numerous authors have pointed out that Schoener was ferociously loyal to Hitler and obeyed his command to the letter. Therefore, I'm not convinced that this is an accurate representation of this order, even if it is a great example of overuse of exclamation marks. Franz Kurowski tells a slightly different story. He says that Schoener was instructed to strike towards the Telshi and Shaole areas, probably in order to make contact with the main German lines. It's not stated when this order was given, but Kurowski says Schoener flew to see Hitler on the 10th of October and told him that the attack wasn't possible. The reason given was because his forces were simply too weak. Worse, he had to explain to Hitler that he was going to have to withdraw back to the Tuchan positions, which Hitler supposedly granted permission for the next day on the 16th. He then says that the orderly evacuation of Riga began on the 12th of October, which is wrong, not only because this is before Schoener's conversation with Hitler on the 15th and 16th, when permission was supposedly granted, but also because Schoener gave the order to evacuate the civilians on the 26th of September and told Hitler on the 30th, if not before. He then says the evacuation, which had 22,500 Soviet prisoners to deal with, 100,000 tons of material need shipping, and fleeing Estonians and Latvian civilians were evacuated in three days. But contradicts himself by admitting that some of these were evacuated in September and early October. Seriously, to say that these sources are unreliable is an understatement. Now, the evacuation clearly happened in phases, starting in late September. But the story about the meeting with Hitler is a little bit more complicated. It's interesting because Haupt says that Hitler forbade the withdrawal from Riga completely, and Schoener ignored him and did it anyway. Whilst Kurowski says that Schoener got permission off Hitler, and I suspect neither account is entirely accurate. Buttar actually says that on the 9th of October, Schoener was the one who proposed to Hitler that it would be best to mount a counterattack. This attack would be mounted from Western Latvia to Memel and then to East Prussia. 
However, this attack was contingent on Hitler agreeing to the evacuation of Riga, in order to release sufficient forces for the operation. As was often the case, Hitler agreed to such a proposal from one of his favoured commanders, where he would have refused to yield an inch if another army commander had made such a request. Newton also says that an attack was mounted or planned to be mounted. There was indeed an intention of restoring the overland communication through an attack from the south. Army Group North was to have facilitated this attack by a thrust from the north. A couple of pages before this, Newton speaks of a counterattack from the Tilsit area in East Prussia towards Memel. Once contact with the forces at Memel was established, the attack was to continue on and to make an overland connection with Army Group North. The forces for this counterattack seem to have been gathering in the previous few days before the 12th of October, perhaps ordered at a similar time as Schoener was ordered to strike south. The attack went in, but was abandoned on the 18th of October, along with Tilsit as well. It seems highly unlikely that the small forces for this Tilsit attack would have been able to reach Memel, let alone Army Group North. But if Schoener had attacked south, they may have been able to link up in the Telshi area, which is certainly more reasonable than going all the way to Kurland. I suspect these two attacks were called for simultaneously, but Schoener decided not to mount his side of the attack. Then the idea of Army Group North linking up or breaking out of its pocket to the south was abandoned and Schoener was compelled to withdraw into the Tuckham's positions. Piecing it together from these accounts, what's more likely to have happened is that Schoener didn't see the point of holding Riga, and wanted to re-establish contact with the main German lines in East Prussia. Hitler agrees and accepts the plan to withdraw from Riga, and have Army Group North attack to the Telshi and Shaole areas. So, a retreat into the Tukum's positions, which was further back, would be counterproductive to this attack. Therefore, Hitler forbids a withdrawal into the Tukum's positions, so that the southern attack has a chance of reaching its objectives. Schoener then flew to see Hitler, explained that the attack he had proposed wasn't possible after all, and then got permission to withdraw to Tukums. That makes much more sense and ties these accounts together in a more sensible version of events. However, this then presents another question. Does this mean that Hitler actually wanted Army Group North to break out of the Baltics at this point, or just link up? Now, none of the sources say that Hitler wanted Army Group North to withdraw, so he may have just wanted a link-up. But given the fact that Hitler had already granted permission on several occasions now for Army Group North to withdraw from various parts of the Baltic States, that they had been withdrawing almost constantly throughout the last month or so, and the huge distances between Army Group North and the forces in East Prussia, it seems unlikely that Hitler was expecting Army Group North to link up and then just hold a huge front from Tukums to Shaole. The sources I have don't allow us to come to any definite conclusions, but I suspect there's more to this particular story than what's being presented. Not only are the German sources contradictory, but we know that they have the agenda to blame Hitler for not allowing Army Group North to withdraw. So they're the last sources that would admit to a breakout from Kurland, because that would go against their narrative of Hitler the madman and the German generals the gods of war. Newton's loyalties and reliability isn't known, he seems more legit than Kurowski and Hapt, but his book was published through Schaefer Military History Publications, which is a small publishing house for Verabu-type material, as explained in Smesler's and Davies' 
the myth of the Eastern Front book. Buttar's account has proven itself more reliable, but there's not enough detail to make any conclusions. Either way, I'm making you aware that Hitler may have wanted to withdraw Army Group North at this point, and that a harder look at the events on or around the 10th of October may produce the evidence needed to back that idea up. So, for any historian out there in Germany who are listening to this, I hereby call upon ye to venture forth into the German archives and slay the Verabu dragon once and for all. Also, I just want to take a couple of minutes to think about all we've just witnessed and ask this question. Could Army Group North have retreated from the Baltics into East Prussia at any point? Army Group North had been positioned as far north as Narva. The Soviets had crushed Army Group Center and had cut off all of Army Group North in the Baltics. Then, Rouse's forces had managed to break through to the Army Group near Riga, but the Soviets crushed Rouse and forced 3rd Panzer Army back to East Prussia. This forced Army Group North, now retreating under Soviet attacks, to fall back to the ports or through Riga. Looking at these events play out the way that they have, it's hard to see how Army Group North could have slipped through to East Prussia, even if they had wanted to. Many authors seek to blame Hitler here for not allowing a withdrawal, but the reality was that the Army Group was withdrawing. It withdrew from the Narva positions as fast as it could, and it appears to have fallen back through Riga and into Kurland as fast as it could. It wasn't because of the Führer's standfast mentality that Army Group North got trapped in Kurland. It was because of the Red Army's victory on the battlefield. Magrathion and the subsequent thrusts to the Gulf of Riga and the Memel area are what caused Army Group North to get outflanked and trapped in the Kurland pocket. Aster, the evacuation of Estonia, was planned and executed at very short notice, and surprised both the Soviet and German high commands in how well it was carried out. Arguably, the Germans could have retreated as Bagration was happening to the south, and escaped the trap before the Soviets got to the Gulf of Riga. But the reasons they didn't are clear. They wanted to keep Finland on side, and they wanted to protect the oil fields in the area. Plus, Bagration happened so quickly and decisively that they didn't really have time to react and pull back their forces. It would be a bit premature to withdraw Army Group North as the fighting in the centre was still going on. So these three factors were what caused them to cling on. And it wasn't just Hitler saying this. Schoener promised Mannerheim that they would hold on to the Baltics, and when Finland capitulated, Army Group North started its retreat, with Hitler's permission. So, it's a bit odd that many of the authors are trying to pin the blame on Hitler for the reason why Army Group North got trapped in Kurland. Most of these authors are German, and many of them don't talk about the atrocities committed by the Wehrmacht during these campaigns, but do talk about the Soviet atrocities. They're keen to paint the German soldiers and generals in as good a light as possible, whilst distancing themselves from the National Socialist regime and ideology. The reality was that they were writing these books during the Cold War, whose politics influenced their accounts. Hitler provides them with a convenient scapegoat. But when you stop and think about it, and when you place the events in chronological order, the Hitler be mad excuse simply doesn't hold up to scrutiny. The German generals were making mistakes. The German troops weren't capable of standing up to the task and Hitler was granting them permission to retreat. But to admit this would imply that the German generals and soldiers at this stage 
weren't as good as they made them out to be. And it would also imply that the Red Army was superior than what they wanted to paint them. In the context of the Cold War, and in the hope that they could distance themselves from National Socialism, whilst also believing in the superiority of the German race, which was part of the National Socialist ideology that they agreed with and fought with, the German generals and authors deliberately distorted history to suit their agenda. But obviously, I'd like to hear your opinion on this. Comment below and let me know. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.